is a vision for an execution of bringing to fruition the Georgia Cyber Center, which serves as a legacy which will impact our state and our nation for generations to come. Governor, welcome. This episode of The Changemaker is a special episode where D. Copenhaver interviews former governor of Georgia, Nathan Deal, at the Nathan Deal Cyber Center. This unprecedented success of a public-private partnership has helped to make Georgia one of the cyber defense capitals of the United States. This was recorded in front of a live audience. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Changemaker Podcast, hosted by Deke Copenhaver. Deke is the author of The Changemaker, a Forbes publishing book that has reached number one on Amazon on multiple occasions and in multiple categories like management skills and total quality management. During this podcast, Deke interviews exceptional change making leaders. Deke currently operates Copenhaver Consulting, where he helps local governments and other public organizations maximize their potential. He's also a sought after public speaker. We hope that the change maker has an impact on you today and that you find takeaways that make you a better leader in your life. Now, here's Deke. Thank you, Deke. Nice to be with you. Thank you all for being here. Well, Governor, having served in elected office for nine years, I can attest to the fact that nothing seems to with governments happen quickly. (laughs) <laughs> However, this center from start to finish was it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen getting something that done, like that done. So talk to us a little bit about the vision for the cyber center and how you and your team were able to make it happen in such an expedited period of time. Well, thank you, Dee. That's a great question. And uh, one that I hope we can at least inspire other leaders and other situations to take advantage of opportunities when they present themselves. And in a nutshell, that's exactly what the state of Georgia did and Augusta University did, is that when we heard in 2013 that the United States Army was considering moving its cybersecurity school from Fort Meade, Maryland to Augusta, Georgia out at Fort Gordon, then uh, local leaders, including Deke and others, Uh, decided, well, this is something that we ought to make it go beyond just the boundaries of United States Army and Fort Gordon. And we began to look and uh, collect information, ask questions, do research. And in a short order, we found that there were a lot of people who thought this was a good idea, but they weren't quite sure that this was something that would be worthwhile for a state to involve its resources with. Well, we had some futuristic leaders in our state government, and I was very fortunate to have these working with me on my team. And in rather short order, uh, we decided that we were going to build the first facility for purposes of education. And uh, Dr. Keel, who is here with us today as president of Augusta University, and uh, Russell, his staff, chief of staff, they're here. And um, they were on board with it from the beginning. We had uh, local leaders. Uh, We had Jim Hull, uh, Will McKnight, for whom the first building was named, uh, as local leaders who said, We want to be a part of this. Deke, being a a mayor here of the city of Augusta and a couple of other mayors that along the way served in various uh, positions during the time of this project moving forward. So we had another person, or two people actually, for whom the second building is named, and that is Michael Schaffer, who is a Uh, an employee here of Augusta University. He had been an employee of mine in the governor's office, and he had been a previous employee of the congressman, Charlie Norwood, from here in Augusta, who is now deceased. So Michael had a background from both the federal, the state, and the local community from the political side of things. And the other person was Teresa McCartney, who is at that time was the head of our Office of Planning and Budget. I might add, she is now uh, the uh, acting chancellor of our university system. And with all of the things that she was able to do to make it so successful in such a short period of time, 
Uh, I wonder what she could do as the head of our entire university system <laughs> if she's made the permanent chancellor. I think that would be a great prospect. For example, uh, we had to float bonds, of course, as you normally do with any state project of this magnitude. And I believe the, the square footage now of the two buildings combined is something like 332,000 square feet. That's a huge complex we have here. Obviously, you had to have uh, government bonds for that purpose, and we did float those bonds, and we did so for the second one. Well, we didn't really have to on the second one. We had enough cash uh, to be able to pay for the second building without having to float the bonds. But because Teresa McCartney was so dedicated and focused on the use of state resources, I understand we're going to be able to pay off that 20-year bond package in five years. Now, that is unheard of for government to be able to do that. So we were fortunate that it all panned out to be so well fitting together. And it was not all of our doing. It was other people working with us. And this is what you see and what you hopefully will learn about as you're here with us. And thank you for being here uh, on this occasion. Uh, you will see that it is a great example of a public, private, uh, partnership, including academia, as a very centerpiece of what we're doing here in this in this these facilities that are here. So that's a long answer to one short question. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I think that's important for people to learn from you and for you to tell the story. And as I mentioned on the way in, nobody's here to hear me talk today. So this is about you, but, but well, let's nobody just, wants to hear an ex governor <laughs> either <laughs> or ex mayor, but, uh, but talked a little bit about, so you served in the Georgia state Senate, you served in the U S house of representatives, you were in the military. And so that kind of gives you a little bit more perspective on the complexity of the project, but how everything fits. Yes. My first elected office was, uh, to the Georgia State Senate, and I served there for 12 years, which is six terms. Uh, I then was elected to Congress, where I was elected for nine terms, and up until I got to be governor, I'd never had an elected office that had a term of longer than two years, so when I got to be governor, it was a four-year term, but uh, under our Constitution, a governor can only serve for two consecutive terms. So uh, I was fortunate the people elected me initially and that they were kind enough to reelect me for a second term. But my service in the military was one that began when I was 18 years old and a freshman at Mercer University. One of the first things I did was I signed up for the ROTC program there. We only had the Army ROTC program at Mercer and I went through the entire four years of uh, wearing a uniform as a part of a military organization of the ROTC, and then was fortunate. In MRSA, we had a, what we called a 3-3 program in those days. You could go three years of undergraduate, and then your fourth year, you could go to law school for your first year. So at the end of four years, I already had one year of law school under my belt, and the Army agreed to let me go ahead and for the next two years finish my law degree and then go on active duty. And I did so, went on active duty as a, an Army JAG officer. And we're in the middle of Vietnam during these years, by the way, folks. Uh, I remember now all of these people uh, talking about all the protests and everything. I was here in Augusta when we were having the protests. In fact, I was assigned, it was an unusual assignment for me uh, as a JAG officer, I was assigned to the legal staff, uh, instructor staff at the military police school, which was at that time was here at Fort Gordon. So for the time I was on active duty, I was assigned uh, teaching civilian law enforcement officers, military law enforcement people about civil disturbance control. Almost begins to be repetitious nowadays with things we're, ha we're having happen in some parts of our country, and that's an unfortunate re reoccurrence of those events. But yes, it gave me a familiarity with um, the Augusta area, lived here for some two years while I was on active duty. And then um, I think all of those elements fit together. I think that was God's plan for me. <laughs> he wanted me to be well prepared <laughs> when something <laughs> like this came along. And I am very thankful that he gave me those opportunities. But you're right, all of those elements, um, state government, 
federal government, military, as well as familiarity with the Augusta area and Fort Gordon itself. All of those were ingredients that helped make this project successful. You know, one, one thing I've seen that has been a hindrance to moving major projects forward is when people let their egos get in the way. Hmm. You know, and there's the old saying that it's amazing what can happen when nobody cares who gets the credit. And I speak from personal experience. You are a very humble man. And I shared with you earlier that I, I was talking to Michael Schaffer yesterday. And I said that the great thing about Governor Deal is he didn't set out to get his name on campus. I mean, he's a very humble man that can work well with others. So talk a little bit about that, because it was it was a team effort. But you really inspired the team around you. Well, the team around me inspired me, yep. and uh, that's that's the important part of it is a partnership and a collaboration. That that's usually what it takes to be able to get big things done in in a relatively short period of time. Let me talk about that short period of time. We started with the first building. As we got into the process of building it, we realized we've already got this filled up, and we've got requests for more space. So before we ever finished the first building, we broke ground on the second building. And um, that's, I think, unusual to have those kind of circumstances around you. But as uh, I've talked with Deke uh, just a little while ago in a podcast that he and I were doing, <laughs> um, it was a con confluence of different things happening locally, statewide, nationally, and internationally, both in the governmental arena as well as in the private sector arena. And that was the rush to have our cybersecurity, I mean, have to have cybersecurity. As we become more technologically advanced and you've left my generation far behind, I have to ask my grandchildren now how to do things on uh, <laughs> Zoom is a challenge for me, I might add. <laughs> but nevertheless, I'm getting a little more accustomed to it. But as we realize that this world is moving rapidly and as things get more consolidated and get more technologically dependent on devices, on the conveyance and storage of information, there are more and more people trying to figure out how they're going to get it, how they're going to take it away from you. How can they use it to their advantage, whether it's to ransom your information packages, which we have constant threats at every level of government trying to tap in to your intellectual resources and information resources. Uh, so it was a challenge, but uh, it was one that fortunately we, we were able to come together on. And, and I, I, leave, I don't want to leave out the members of our state general assembly, our legislative branch of government. In order to get bonds, especially when you're talking about multi-million dollar bond packages, they have to agree that the governor who puts these into his budget proposal, and you have to put them in your budget proposal to show how you're going to pay the interest on those bonds, um, they have to agree with you to pass that budget. And we were fortunate to have uh, across the aisle unanimous type support, not total, but almost unanimous support for supporting the funding necessary to make this project possible. So there are a lot of players and all of them acted responsibly. And quite honestly, all of them acted with courage and they did not do it because they wanted credit for it. They did it because they thought it was going to be good for the people of our state, of the local community, and good for the entire country. And we think it's proven to be exactly that. Well, and two terms that you don't necessarily associate with each other these days are politics and innovation. <laughs> but I think you in your role showed, and your team's role, and state government's role, that governments can innovate. This is a concrete example of that. Well, that's true, Deke, and you being in elected politics, you know the dangers of that. <laughs> uh, you know, everybody wants to claim something that they have done while they've been in office. And if you want to argue against term limits, that's a pretty good argument <laughs> against it, is that uh, everybody's trying to do something in a hurry because, as I just indicated to you, uh, our entire state legislature, both our House and our Senate at the state level, they're on two-year terms. Our governor has a four-year term, 
um, our members of the House of Representatives in Washington, they have two year terms. So if you're in a hurry to make a mark that somebody can credit to your resume, then you're in a hurry. But sometimes you get in too big a hurry and you don't think it out. You don't have the underground of uh, the un underlying groundwork done to be able to make them successful. But we were able to put all of that time frame package together as well as setting aside anybody's personal agenda if they had one. And I don't recall a single personal type agenda that arose during the course of making these buildings and this entire undertaking uh, possible. We had great cooperation. Well, and, and oftentimes I, I see elected officials and it does become the immediacy of the moment and the issue that's in front of you. And so looking towards the, the time beyond your term in office and your term in leadership, I, I think you've done that with this facility. I've always said with talk about how, how the revenues generated from this facility are used, because I think that was visionary and looking towards the future. <laughs> Well, sometimes uh, people have great reservations about how you spend taxpayers' money uh, when you involve private organizations, private corporations in the process. And that's a legitimate concern. You do not want taxpayers to feel that their resources have been unduly used for private companies or private individuals' advancement. Uh, that was not the case. This was a, a situation where the private companies put their money into the process to make it work. So the government did not have to put more of its resources into the pot. And therefore, it was very successful for us to be able to rely on that public-private partnership that, you know, that's a term that you hear so much of, public-private partnerships. A lot of them, I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure how private they are, <laughs> or in some cases, I'm not sure how public they are, uh, but there are examples where they work. I, if you want an example of one that works, look at this, this what we did here. It was definitely that. Well, I, I had said during my time in office that I always wanted Augusta to become a model city for other cities to learn from, and this is a great example of that, and I'm hoping that, you know, other communities will learn that governments and the private sector can work together, and we can have collaboration with, you know, the Department of Defense. And if everybody just will come together on the same page, that's, you can do amazing things. And this is a facility is a prime example of that. Yes. And that's very true. That's easier said than done. Do you the old <laughs> cliche? Uh, but it did happen here. And uh, we had uh, local government, we had the state government, we had uh, federal government, we had the military, and we, of course, had private industry, all of them working toward a common goal. And it benefited not only the Augusta area, not only the state of Georgia, um, not only the Army, uh, but it benefited everybody in the, in the arena, so to speak, and will continue to do so into the future, especially on the academic side of it, because Augusta University is... Uh, offering degrees in computer science and uh, cybersecurity. I understand in the fall of 2022, you may be even offering a doctorate in that field. Is that right, Dr. Keel? Yes, he indicates that that's true. So I'm sure he's seeing people who are students that are interested in this field saying, well, you know, I believe Augusta University is a place I want to go. So when that happens, as the community as a large, at large understands, uh, a vibrant student body who come here for the right reasons, um, then it helps everybody in this area, and it helps our state and helps our country. I, I've always said that really for cities to grow and be sustainable, you have to attract and keep the best and brightest young minds. And I think this facility and Augusta University is doing that. So Governor, I, I just want to say thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being here today. Do you have time for a few questions? Certainly. And if I don't know the answer, I've got some good folks to back me up. That's what makes any, any elected official successful is to have good people to back them up when they don't know the answer. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not ashamed to call on them when they, when they can help me out. Yes, sir.
a, a particular mentor. You know, everybody has always asked me about who my mentors were and who my heroes were and all of that. I guess I'm not a person that sort of focuses on that. My biggest mentors were my parents. My father was a vocational agriculture teacher. My mother was a first grade school teacher for about 40 years. Um, they taught me the kind of things that stood me in good stead. Now, there are certainly people along the way who helped me, who gave me guidance and direction, but I was not guilty of hero worship in that regard, but I had people who showed me opportunities, who gave me opportunities, who encouraged me. And I, on that note, I, let me leave and answer your question being this. Some of the most important people are not necessarily your mentors nor your heroes. Some of the most important people in your life will be those who encourage you to step out, to take a chance, to try to do something that you're not sure you can do. Uh, I would have never run for public office had I not had good friends who encouraged me to take those steps. So all of us can be encouragers. And there are people that you know that you probably already are serving as encouragers for, and there are certainly others that you can be an encourager for them. You may not be able to be their mentor, but when they are a little bit doubtful about what step to take, when your children or your grandchildren or whomever you might be associated with are facing questions in their lives about choices, then encouragers are very, very important people. Thank you for your question. Do we have another? Yes, ma'am. Um, Governor Deal, yes, today. Um, I wanted to just share with you, I uh, watched the project and the announcement from Canada for a couple of years, um, and Michael Schaefer can we brought a group down from Canada in 2019 to tour the Georgia Cyber Center uh, government and industry leaders. And I can tell you, um, they left both awestruck and dumbfounded on what you and your group team accomplished. My uh, question for you is, either during or after, did you have reach outs from other states, other leaders, other countries asking you, why you did it, how you did it, what was the formula, what you learned, because what you and this whole state have accomplished is phenomenal. Well, thank you for the compliment. I'm gonna get Deke to interpret the question. <laughs> What'd she ask? Have you had other leaders throughout the um, nation and throughout the world reach out to you and ask you how oh. you and the team did this? Oh. Yes, and I, I claim full credit when I answer those <laughs> questions. <laughs> He's magic. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's one of the good things. When you do things right and they work, you have people from all over the country, and, and we've had governors, we've had legislative leaders from all over the United States ask us, well, how did you get this done? We had another very successful area of my administration, and that was criminal justice reform. And we are noted now as the leading state in terms of meaningful criminal justice reform. And we've had people from all over the United States, and literally all over the world, uh, coming and talking to, to me and to many of the leaders that, that helped put those reforms in place. But yes, this is an example that is noteworthy, and people, especially those who are attuned to this particular area of cybersecurity. Yes, they have paid great attention. And we tell them that if they'll just move here and they'll go to work here, uh, they'll get to know it a whole lot better. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Yes, sir. Uh, Governor, I know that uh, on projects like this, there are almost always studies of economic impact. Do, do you have any numbers as to the economic impact that this center uh, uh, it has had, is having, and is projected to have on the local economy and the state. Yes, and Chief, uh, Chris Riley was my former chief of staff, and he was one of those that helped ride herd on making sure this project got through the legislative process and the funding process. But that is the, the best example. The, the benefits in dollars 
will certainly show up when those 20-year bonds are paid off at the end of five years. And then the revenue from the rentals of the building facilities, all of those will be revenue that does not have to go as dedication just for a retirement of bond debt. Um, but the other benefits are sometimes very difficult to put monetary uh, numbers uh, associated with them. We know that there have been allied industries who are locating to this area of the state of Georgia that would not have come but for this facility. Now, I, I'm sure that if I had Pat Wilson, who's head of our Department of Economic Development here, he'd probably have those numbers because he's proud of those because they are a part of our bragging portfolio when we talk about what's happening in Georgia. Um, and on the uh, educational side, to uh, educate people who have to come here and become a, a familiar with our state and with this part of our state and have them get their degrees and then go to the innermost parts of the world, actually. Um, and they carry, if they are, the, if they are a diploma holder, um, they probably have a diploma that has Augusta University on it tacked on their wall. And now I've had experience with that from our Georgia Tech, which is obviously one of the great institutions that our state is very proud of. And as governor, when I went around the world to um, try to solicit foreign companies to come back to Georgia, invariably, almost all of those companies had at least one Georgia Tech graduate. I predict that in the not too distant future, when people are going around the world and they see somebody that is in dealing with cybersecurity issues, they're gonna see an Augusta University diploma on their walls. So it, it all has benefits, financial, cultural, educational, and it's, we can put the dollar figure when we get them all uh, collated uh, as to what the actual dollar benefit is. But, um, you know, I, I don't have somebody like that can give us those dollar figures right now. But that's a very good question. And I'm going to ask that question when I get back. <laughs> <laughs> Governor, just to follow up on that, Unisys was obviously one of the first big companies to move down to buy into your vision, to Deke's vision, uh, that it went well beyond this building, but the entire region was being transformed by cyber. And, and so when you look at the economic benefit, when we do um, as, as Unisys, you know, we committed to you know, everything we buy, we buy local. And that makes a difference, and, and it doesn't show up in, in the core numbers. Uh, and our, our associates go to school at Augusta University and Augusta Tech and the, the local places here. So I would just uh, ask you to maybe talk a little bit about the ripple effect, this building and, and your commitment to get it done. And I remember you, you didn't just get the money, but you said get the money and you have to start digging into the dirt right away. <laughs> um, so you really put that urgency into it. But talk about the ripple effects it's had on the whole community. Well, I think you're right. And Unisys is one of those that we are very thankful for because you set the tone. And uh, we've had others that have followed in your footsteps. And I think there will continue to be more and more companies that are directly involved in cybersecurity issues of their own. And um, that ripple effect is very real. Now, we normally think about it in terms of manufacturing type facilities. And to give you an example, on the other river, on the other side of the state of Georgia, we've got the Savannah over here, we've got the Chattahoochee on the other side that separates us from Alabama. Uh, on that side of the state, several many years ago now, Kia Manufacturing, a South Korea company, came, and I believe they now employ somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000, 3,600 people. But what happened there was their suppliers relocated to be close to them in West Georgia. And we are told that the number of jobs created by the supplier community is as least as many as the manufacturer itself. So I'm sure if you translate that into the cybersecurity arena, the same thing is going to prove to be true.
I'll tell you, walking through the, the halls of, of these two buildings on this, this visit and seeing all the new company names that are there that have staff here and going out and finding coffee shops lining Broad Street right. up and down and, and being open in the morning, that is all part of this. And, and have group, you gotten a latte named after Unisys yet? <laughs> you know, I'm still working on that. I'm going to talk to John and Pat about that. Um, but the CFF, this group, which normally convenes in Davos, Switzerland, at the World Economic Forum, right. chose to come here right. in large part because of this ecosystem that includes education, that includes industry, that includes government, all working together so well that I'm just thrilled that you would come here and, and, and Deke, you're being, you're being asking the questions, but you could also be answering them. You're, <laughs> you're a force of nature in this town for a long time. You continue to be. And all of this sort of is revolving around that vision you guys had. Well, thank you. You, you answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I, I just want to say thank you. And I think a lot of it, so I do executive coaching now and keynote speaking, but I spoke to um, an ownership retreat for a chain restaurant recently about building cultures, right? And I think that's what this is when you talk about the ecosystem but you uh, and I'm after I did my hour and a half speech, I told my wife, I could have just said that um, if treat your employees and your customers the way you want to be treated. And there you go. But this is this is a facility that's sort of a magnet that brings people in. And as was mentioned, you know, we had a delegation from Canada. Well, they go back and they talk about this facility. So it's really when I was in office, I um, Billy Payne, then chairman of the Augusta National, said that he was going to make the Masters into the preeminent sporting event in the world. And I took that as a call to action that everything we focus on in Augusta should be allowing us to become the preeminent mid-sized city in the U.S. And this puts us in a position to do that. It's, it's impressive. And, but it took all those people working together. Thank you. Uh, Governor, on behalf of the uh, Board of Directors, the trustees of the Cyber Future Foundation, we present this to you. And you are in, in very uh, uh, tall cotton, as we say in Texas, and I think you say in Georgia as well. So thank you for being here. Thank you for everything that you have done to, to create this amazing facility that absolutely will be a model for others. Uh, and, and, and thank you so much. We also want to thank Paul. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and without Tom, without Catherine, uh, and you can imagine the, you know, the northern neighbors, all of it coming together. This has been, uh, you know, a great find for us. And there are only so many in the in the country, uh, and we're going around. So, uh, you know, thank you, Tom. Thanks to Brigitte Shafia. Thank you, Dick, for having us and, and making this happen. So, thank you all. Thank you.